And thank you very much to Rieti for the hospitality and for hosting us. Uh, Vice Chairman Yoshida, um, Chairman Urata-san, um, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Shiro Armstrong from the ANU, as I was just introduced. Uh, my role is to moderate this panel. Um, we were lucky to have State Minister for Economy, Trade and Industry, Nakatani-san, and Indonesia's Finance Minister, Sri Mulyani, uh, open up the issues for us in a really nice way, uh, and I, I want to thank them for taking their time. So welcome to the panel discussion on Towards Comprehensive Regional Security. The plan now is to get deeper into the issues and to try to find some ways forward. Uh, we face a, a set of big risks and crises that threaten the global order. Uh, these risks and challenges were outlined by State Minister Nakatani. Now, we need international cooperation to solve these major challenges, but that's made much harder, of course, by strategic competition between China and the United States. So a key question for our countries in Asia is how to bring the management of these risks together in a way that narrow ideas of national security don't dominate economic and other interests. How can we get the balance right instead of seeing economic interests and national security as simple zero-sum trade-offs. And I think um, it was made very clear to us the challenges we face from the keynote speeches, and we are here in Japan because Japan is a key player in all of this. As the world's third largest economy, um, now doubling its defence budget, uh, implementing new economic security laws, and, of course, as State Minister Nakatani said, now emphasising um, strengthening of economic relations with trusted countries. Um, he also acknowledged that Japan is emphasising multilateralism, uh, and that is a difficult balance, as he acknowledged, uh, and, of course, at the centre of those issues is China and how Japan and the region manages the rise of China. So I look forward to getting deeper into those issues with our panel. Um, and, of course, in this symposium, we're exploring the concept uh, and dimensions of comprehensive security for Asia. Uh, it was central, this idea of comprehensive security, central to Japanese thinking in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And it's an idea that is formally embedded in ASEAN-centred regional architecture since 1976, in fact, uh, when the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation was first signed. So. Um, with that, uh, I want to introduce our panellists uh, and then hear from each panellist initially uh, and open up to discussion. Uh, so we're delighted to have um, four distinguished uh, academics uh, and policy practitioners to speak to us. Um, the first is Professor Danny Kwa. Uh, he's Lee Kashing Professor of Economics and Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Uh, and the second speaker will be Professor Meli Caballero Anthony, Professor of International Relations and the Head of Center for Non-Traditional Security Studies and the President's Chair in International Relations and Security Studies at RSIS in the Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. Uh, third, Pak Rizal Sukma, Senior Fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS in Jakarta and former Indonesian ambassador to the United Kingdom. Uh, and last but not least, next to me is uh, Professor Emeritus Shujiro Urata, uh, who is now recently um, been appointed chairman of Rieti. Congratulations, Urata-san. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to Danny for his first remarks, uh, and then we'll move on to Meli. Thanks, Danny. Thank you, Shiro-san. Um, let me begin by thanking the institutions, VT and ANU, for inviting us to take part in this important conversation. I want to say how much I agree with what State Minister and Shiro and others have emphasized, that we need to look forwards to a way, a constructive way, where we can work together that uh, we need to be careful that security considerations are important, but they should not be overwhelming and dominate all others that also matter 
to us in the region and to humanity more generally. Historically, how Japan and indeed ASEAN have navigated this is to emphasize multilateralism, institution building, and economic openness as a way both to strengthen our security and also our economic performance. My worry, and this is what I want to spend my five minutes here talking about, is that the current conjuncture is making many of us move in the opposite direction, away from the good constructive journey that we have been on. And the reason that we're seduced into this counterproductive direction is that we've been seized by the idea of a false dichotomy. A dichotomy between, on the one hand, how we keep ourselves safe, and on the other hand, how we keep ourselves economically prosperous, how we take care of the weak and vulnerable in all our societies. This false dichotomy is seductive into making us think of the situation that we're in as forcing a choice between just one or the other. Whereas in reality, what we should be doing is trying to advance both sets of considerations. Let me um, take a minute or so to say how this idea of false dichotomy infests so much policy discussions that the world has been in most recently. Let me give just two examples. Over the course of the pandemic, the global pandemic, in each of our respective nations, we disagreed over what seemed to be a dichotomy. On the one hand, how much lockdown should there be to keep our people safe? And on the other hand, how much the economy should be kept going, maintaining livelihoods? When we, faced with an, when we were faced early on in the pandemic with an either or choice between these two, different nations made different choices. Many of us chose quite harsh lockdowns because our first priority was to keep people safe. But over the course of the last three years, vaccines came online, we understood better how to manage the pandemic, and our national choices changed. The contours of that trade-off between what at first seemed to be a, di a dichotomy, keeping our people safe and secure, and on the other hand, keeping economic livelihoods going, was actually no longer that sharp a trade-off. And for most nations in the world, we pivoted to being able to do both, keep security, keep our people safe, but also kickstart our economies again. Most nations in the world recognize that it was a false dichotomy that we were faced with at the beginning that changed as our understanding changed. Of course, you and I know not all countries did this. Until recently, China was a very significant exception to this pivot, and they kept a harsh lockdown until again very recently. But after that, the whole world recognizes the false dichotomy was not a way to go down. My second example is when we think about income inequality in each of our societies. We think that on the one hand, income inequality destroys social cohesion, and therefore, we needed to do everything we could to reduce income inequality. But on the other hand, there are those who say that income inequality has become unfairly a whipping boy for all other challenges that our societies should indeed be working to fix. And that our obsession with inequality risks an outcome where indeed inequality is zeroed out, but that's happened because all of us have been made equally poor. Another false dichotomy. Over the pandemic, keep our people safe and secure, or allow economic prosperity. For income inequality, maintain social cohesion, or allow economies to grow. It turns out that it's neither naive 
nor delusional to want improvement along all these different dimensions, economics and security. And it is that, that there are trade-offs and that we can achieve both of them, provided circumstances are right, that is the mindset that we need to uh, use to come into the current conjuncture when so much of the world is now obsessed with only security. So much of the world seems to have forgotten the good lessons that we in Japan and in South A Asia experienced over the last few decades, that we could have both. We fell into a mode of thinking that we needed the world global economy to decouple. We needed to do friend shoring. We needed our supply chains to be strategic. And we forget that these categories seek to, as the East Asia Forum Quarterly put aptly, sacrifice economic openness, growth, and adaptable supply chains. And let me paraphrase, subordinate third nation's key national interests to a geopolitical competition that is by its very nature a zero-sum game. We need to get away from thinking that. Let me conclude, having given this warning, to say how indeed we can. Sure, along with everybody else, on the environment front, I worry about how China today produces 50% of the world's wind turbines, 67 of the world's solar panels, over 90% of the world's electric storage batteries. But I worry about this, not because I want to view China as a geopolitical rival, but to realize that without China, the whole world is not going to achieve its green energy transition. Sure, I worry about how Taiwan today produces over 80% of the world's high-end semiconductors. I worry about this not because Taiwan is on the hot end of US-China geopolitical rivalry, but because Taiwan has over 200 earthquakes every 365 days. It is simply an insecure region where our economic perspectives need to be appropriately diversified, but not through harsh geopolitical security considerations. My conclusion from this, Hirosan and panelists, is that we need to carefully distinguish different kinds of competition so we don't get sucked into this false dichotomy view of the world. The first kind of competition is economic competition, and the second kind is security competition. And we need to keep these two distinct. In one of these, economic competition, you get ahead by improving yourself. You welcome competition because it raises your own productivity. And you do that latter by investing in schools, succeeding in research and development, investing in public infrastructure, improving the human capital in your people by developing skills. Economic competition is fierce and intense, but we all should welcome it because in this, you get ahead by improving yourself. In security competition, however, you get ahead by keeping others down, by encircling them, by containing them, by restricting to them the availability of frontier technologies. If we continue to go down the road of false dichotomies and we focus on only security competition as a way in which nations deal with each other, our world is going to be poorer, more miserable, less happy, and more dangerous. And we need to bring back into the conversation the right ideas about advancing our security by advancing the economies and the economic well-being of all of us in the world. Thank you very much, Shiro-san. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Danny. Uh, that gets us off to a nice start. Uh, I'll now invite Nelly to make her opening remarks.
Thank you, Shiro. Um, let me also um, express my uh, thanks and appreciation to Reiti and the ANU for the kind invitation to join this very important conversation at this point in time when, um, <coughs> as, as the minister have said, and of also uh, Danny has mentioned, the world appears to be, um, the world that you use, Danny, is uh, distracted <laughs> or um <coughs> having this dichotomy of, of, of choices. So I have, in the time allotted to me, just have one key um, point, which I will develop into three sub-points. To avoid this so-called dichotomy of choices, or to avoid being distracted by the real challenges out there, I think the main message that I want to um, convey is that for countries, particularly in the region, East Asia, we have to claim back, claim back the very concept that we have always promoted as we grew and as we started to interact with each other. And that concept, as already mentioned, is the concept of comprehensive security. As noted by Shiro, Japan was one of the proponents of comprehensive security in the 70s and 80s. And Japan talked about the concern, not just of security, but highlighted economic issues, including, of course, the supply of international energy and food, right? In Southeast Asia, particularly as the countries where, you know, starting to build their own nations as a result of independence and having to go through the challenges of trying to build a cohesive society. Comprehensive security was a very key security concept, but it widened that, uh, that concern beyond military security to economic, but included political security and social security. It came in various manifestations, and that is shared, that was echoed in the 70s and in the 80s and in the 1990s. But comprehensive security, which actually made everyone feel secure that you know, we have to build our state and our economy, was very state-centric. It just talks about the interests of the state. It wasn't until the 1990s when this whole comprehensive security was challenged and again, Japan was at the forefront in introducing, as a result of the Asian financial crisis in the 1990s, the concept of human security. And what was human security? Of course, economic, right? But added in it, health security, environmental security, political security, and even community security. So while comprehensive security answered the question, what else, what else are the threats to national security? Human security brought down the level of analysis to say, whose security are you talking about and for whom? So if we bring back and claim back those concepts that were very, that were at the very heart of Japanese and Southeast Asian thinking, why is this important to bring back? And that brings me to my second point. Because as noted by Minister Nakatani, many of the challenges we face today, and as also highlighted by my co-speaker, Danny, have transnational implications. Two, I shall mention, and that has also been, uh, that has been cited, is the impact of the global pandemic. Now, in the early 2000s, I recall the Japanese uh, Vice Minister for Health, Minister Takemi, was talking about the importance of health security. And that was at the heart of Japan's human security concept. Why? Because at the time when you had the Asian financial crisis and as a result of SARS, what uh, the severe acute respiratory son syndrome what the message was that an insecurity in one state, an outbreak in a particular state,
can have global implications. An insecurity in one state is an insecurity for all. And that whole thing was replayed again when we face COVID-19 in, in 2020. Right, gosh, it's already four <laughs> years now. <laughs> and that's not all, right? We saw how COVID-19 appended our lives by lockdowns, by the worst economic contraction, which reminds us of the 1930 economic depression, right? And the kind of geopolitics that actually emerged when there was the blame game as to who start, which started the, the, uh, the outbreak of the virus, how it should be done, the failure of global institutions, the attack against the WHO and many others. The second is, of course, the impact of climate change. We saw that as, as a result of a, um, a changing global environment, we have frequent or most often extreme weather events that has caused so far, in 2021 alone, the displacement or the, uh, the uh, of over 66.6 .6 million people across the world. As a result of climate change, because of displacement, the economic cost so far is about 780, um, sorry, it's 400 and, uh, million dollars, billion dollars, and is expected by the year 2050 to increase by 1.4 billion to 4.7 billion. These are just numbers. But if you look at the impact of the swathe of population uh, dis displacement, the threat of the outbreak of new diseases, the WHO has told us that COVID-19 is not going to be the last one. And the interconnection between climate security, the changes in the climate, and that of outbreaks of infectious diseases we'll see more virulent diseases coming our way. So with this kind of transborder, transnational security challenges, there's a compelling argument for more robust cooperation across the board. And this is something, if I talk about claiming back the argument, in the early 1990s, when Japan and the rest of or Southeast Asia has talked about comprehensive security. Cooperative and common security were the approaches that were uh, promoted, that were advanced. And this is why we have to bring it back because in light of the numerous transnational or non-traditional security challenges, there's no way but the global community to actually bring back that common and cooperative security challenges, uh, uh, approaches. But we are distracted, as Danny has mentioned, in the cacophony of the threat of, and the, the, the notion about deterrence, the notion about containment, the notion about the need to decouple. At the time when we, there is really the imperative to promote cooperative security. So the third one, the third point in claiming back is the fact that Asia, right, East Asia, that has been at the forefront of promoting the ideas of comprehensive and human security, must therefore lead in this endeavor. How do you lead? Is to ensure that the regional institutions that have been created, whether it is uh, the ASEAN-led institution, ASEAN, ASEAN plus three, right, the East Asia Summit, and the economic cooperation that have been there, the economic frameworks, and the security institutions have been out there. And what are they? They're numerous. ASEAN Defense Ministerial Meeting, right? The ASEAN Regional Forum. These are frameworks that promote cooperation, that promote inclusion, and uh, frowns from the concept of exclusion. You need, therefore, to avoid fragmentation as a result of a highly interconnected environment. And this is the paradox. As we actually become closer, because we are, hype, uh, we are hyper interconnect, interconnected, we talk about supply chain, 
the world has been increasingly fragmented. Fragmentation, not just a result of political difference, but the, the so-called zero-sum game, but also fragmentation because our societies are increasingly getting marginalized. Marginalized because of inequality, economic inequality. And as a result, they become vulnerable to information, misinformation, and disinformation. That, as a result, also results in the loss of trust in institutions. So my conclusion, and going back to the main argument, in light of fragmentation, in light of distraction, in light of having to choose this dichotomy that Danny was mentioning, we have to bring back consciously the notion of the values of comprehensive and human security and promote cooperative and common security. These were the, the buzzwords of the 1990s which have become even more urgent and even more compelling in light of a world, right, in a world that is increasingly cha uh, changing. So in a climate change world that we now have, which brings us to 21st century security challenges, Asia has to lead in bringing back the concept of comprehensive security and human security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meli. Uh, Pak Rizal. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to echo my colleagues to thank the Reiti and the ANU and Shiro, uh, Professor Dresdell, and uh, I also would like to congratulate Urata-san for your uh, new uh, position. Uh, it's good to be back in Japan after five years, you know, because of the pandemic, and also I got caught up in, in the UK before as the ambassador. Now I have a problem, because what I'm going to say actually Mostly it's been mentioned by, <laughs> by, by Meli uh, on, on the idea and the, the, the importance of bringing back you know, the whole discourse and concept of comprehensive security into the uh, regional uh, 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 security discourses. But you know, I have to earn this trick, right? So I need to uh, uh, come up and challenge you know, some of the ideas that have been put forward. Uh, basically, I will try to answer two very basic questions. Number one, is it relevant to talk about you know, the comprehensive security within the current context of geopolitical and geoeconomic rivalry that we are seeing as the main characteristic that defines the regions you know, since I would say probably five to seven years uh, uh, ago. The second uh, question, uh, can we bring back that concept to life again? You know, so it's like in a coma on life support in the hospital, so you need to uh, resuscitate, you know, that concept, and then how to bring it back, you know, into the center of regional security discourse and practices. Uh, uh, so I will focus more on the second one because the first one has been mentioned by Professor Kwan and also by by Meli. So we know that you know we are facing this return of power politics, the rivalry among the great powers, and and so on as the uh, more dominant characteristic of the uh, 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 regional uh, security in, uh, at the moment. So you know, I will not go back you know to to that you know uh, part of the discussion so i will uh, focus more on other uh, uh, issues especially the second uh, second questions so i think these uh, uh, issues that have been mentioned by professor kwa and also by meli the nominant of the realist you know argument about how we can ensure and secure you know our national and also regional security through military power through the military and defense initiative i think uh, bring you know a serious implication for how we, uh, and especially uh, countries in the region, think about you know, how we can achieve those uh, security. So instead of uh, continuing the multilateral dialogues, multilateral cooperation across issues, and, and also norm setting, norm shaping, like the what ASEAN is doing, and the institution building, we see more and more, I think, countries uh, begin to pay more attention to military build up, power projection, and also military alliance as an instrument you know, to ensure uh, our national security and also uh, they at least believe that will contribute to the uh, regional security. So the weakening of the ASEAN-centered institution and the strengthening of new minilateral arrangements such as the AUKUS, the Quad, I think reflective you know, of this trend. So here ASEAN might be a problem, but can also be a solution. So on the one hand, ASEAN institution are not adequate in addressing the problem of power politics. But on the other hand, 
ASEAN forms of cooperation also offer opportunity for managing and mitigating power politics from undermining security and stability in the region. Uh, the problem is really, you know, what are the next steps? You know, what should we do? You know, what, what needs to be done you know, in order to bring back the, uh, uh, the, the, you call it as a SOGO Anzen Hasho, as a comprehensive security into the center of the discourse and also practices of regional security cooperations. Any management of regional security needs to consider two key elements. Eh? Number one, we need to recognize that we live in a three-dimensional regional security order in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. So we do have the realist order. This is basically the reality that talk about balance of power, military alliance, and so on. It's real. It's out there. And then I think it's being pursued by many of us in the region. The second dimension is what I call normative order. This is, you know, those countries who think that, you know, by uh, being nice, you know, you everybody will also behave nicely to you and so on, believe in norms and, 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 and values. The third dimension is the institutionalist order. Those countries who believe that strong institution important not only to deter bad behavior, but also to facilitate cooperation. So I think Professor Dresdale and those who study, you know, IR, you know, really understand this kind of, you know, a paradigm in, 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 in international uh, relations. So the current situation really suggests that a realist order is becoming more and more dominant. You know, people begin to think that the only way to ensure security is actually by sharpening your knife and then stocking, you know, your uh, 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 weapons, you know, at home. Uh, so, you know, we need to really address this. How? Mainly already answered that by bringing back the comprehensive security into the center of the search for regional uh, security. And second need that, uh, point that we need to consider, comprehensive security has in the past served as the defining framework for the region in thinking about how to pursue national security and how to cooperate with other nations in managing regional order that can contribute to national security of all. So it's basically the security, you can achieve security with you know, other nations together you know, and cooperate with them rather than you, know, you try to achieve security against anyone uh, uh, around your uh, neighborhood. Uh, so by bringing this notion of comprehensive security back and how this framework can be adjusted and must be adjusted to the current problems of the realist dimension of regional order, we could try to push a breakthrough you know, in the stagnant security narrative in the region today. How should we do this? So I think plenty of ideas and plenty of uh, modalities already out there, which we can, you know, I think, uh, uh, explore uh, further. One, I think, institution that you know, we tend to forget, which is the ASEAN Regional Forum, actually offer a lot of uh, 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 ingredients or elements that you know, we can take up and then try to implement it you know, in a different setting, in a different context. Here, I would like again to repeat what I've been calling for the last 10 years. We need to abolish the ASEAN Regional Forum and then bring the whole platform into the East Asia Summit as the institution that is still underdeveloped, under-institutionalized, but I think has great promise you know, to be a platform for everyone in the region you know, to bring back the notion of comprehensive security adopt the areas of cooperation of the ASEAN Regional Forum and then try to address the current problem that we are facing. There are also others, I think, uh, other uh, points or other uh, steps that we can take. So I will leave that you know, for the discussion later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pak Rizal. Uh, and finally, to Urata-san. Shiro-san, Thank you very much, Shiro-san. International relations experts are all here, and uh, to be able to take part in this panel discussion with such uh, distinguished experts, um, I'm really grateful. I am an economist, and economic security discussions in recent years. I do believe that uh, international relations experts are taking part in such discussions. 
And as an economist myself, I'd like to make my own contributions from my perspective. So it's uh, um, really a great opportunity for me. Thank you very much. So as I said, I am an economist. So um, economic security is something that I would like to express my opinions about. My opinions on are very much in line with what Danny has expressed already. Security, economic security, and economic growth, uh, these uh, should not be dichotomized. Discussions are centering around this dichotomy, but then I don't believe such, believe in such dichotomy, because uh, both can be pursued at the same time, and that's very important. I have prepared my talking points in English, but um, as most of the people in the audience are in this venue are Japanese or um, also online audience. The majority may be Japanese, so I'd like to speak in Japanese. And I'd like to talk about three things. One, in order to realize economic security, uh, there are many different economic policies uh, under formulation. And what is very important is that such economic policies, how would they affect the real economy? That has to be precisely analyzed and evaluated. Those economic security policies, how would they affect the economy? So that has to be prudently analyzed. That's number one. And the second point is, in order to achieve economic security, rule-based investment, trade, and also economy uh, need to be uh, prepared. And we need to have systems for that. And if we can do that, not just economic security, but also economic growth can be achieved at the same time. That's my second point. And the third point is, what is uh, important most of all is that the US-China confrontation, um, this confrontation should not develop into a full-fledged conflict. We need to make diplomatic efforts in order to avoid that. So these are the three points I wanted to make. So to further go into the details of these three points, first about economic security. Economic security is a new concept, and actually in doing research on that, I have read many different uh, literature and uh, that I couldn't really find the definition of economic security. In my mind, economic security can be defined that when uh, there are economic threats, by implementing economic policies, the national land or independence, or maybe um, people's lives and health, and also assets should be protected. So I think that's uh, how I would define economic security. And if this definition holds, what's important is to identify what are the economic threats. And I think there are at least three types of economic threats. Number one is natural disasters. That has been touched upon, climate change and also COVID. And then um, as a kind of consequence, um, earthquakes, maybe, or a flood. So those um, natural disasters um, may pose a threat to the economy. And the second type is, in terms of the economic threats, and I think it's in a narrow sense, and this is uh, what I would say, for instance, if there is an important critical technology, and then um, this technology um, can be taken over by an adversary country, and this adversary country taking over this um, technology uses that technology against us, like espionage, spying activities, posing a threat to our country, or um, purchasing those companies which 
possess those advanced technologies to pose threats to our country. So that can be the second type. And the third threat is what can be called economic statecraft. It's difficult to translate that into Japanese, but using economic activities, uh, posing threats to uh, the um, another country, uh, that can be another threat. And I think that is uh, oftentimes exercised by China, like putting a ban or restrictions on the rare earth uh, exportation. So this can be one form of economic statecraft. So these are the three types of economic threats. And how can we respond to those three? Number one is natural disasters as economic threats. And then we need to have international cooperation for that. And of course, uh, each country can respond to a natural disaster to a certain extent. But as discussed already, international cooperation is very important in this sphere. Uh, be it an adversary country or allied country, uh, I think this is where international cooperation is needed. As for the second time, which, which is a, a kind of a exploitation of technologies against a, such a threat, we have to have a kind of a system in place to protect our important critical technologies. And if I am um, to cite one example from Japan, uh, two years ago, um, Japan changed its uh, foreign currency law, which is to restrict foreign companies purchasing Japanese companies. And that was one of the aim of this law, in my mind, at least. And then um, there was a problem of, uh, as I said, an adversary country acquiring um, advanced uh, technologies through the acquisition of the companies in Japan. Uh, this uh, can pose a um, negative threat to Japan in the future. Therefore, inward investment into Japan should be restricted. So that's what's been done. And the third threat is economic statecraft. In this sense, uh, we have to avoid having too much dependence on such countries. In the example of rare earth, we should reduce the dependence on the countries which are exercising economic statecraft and in turn increase the dependence among the like-minded countries, as expressed in the term friend shoring. So in order to uh, realize economic security, these can be the responses. And those responses may negatively affect economic growth. So inward um, investment into Japan from overseas, if uh, this is restricted, uh, the amount is quite small to begin with, and since around 2000 or even before, uh, the Japanese government uh, has been trying to come up with different measures to increase the amount of investment coming from outside of Japan. But because of um, economic security becoming a more of an issue, uh, such investment is now restricted, and this can negatively affect economic growth of this country. That has to be understood. And in terms of uh, the third response that can be friend shoring, now this can also negatively affect economic growth. There is a high po possibility of that. So economic security is important indeed. However, in order to realize economic security, there are policies in place, and how would they affect, would they affect economic growth? That has to be analyzed. And between economic security and economic growth, I think there is a very interesting uh, link. If uh, economic security is strengthened too much, reinforced too much, economic growth can become stagnant. And there is a good example in North Korea. And on the other hand, if you would like to achieve economic growth, economic security, is it neglected? I don't think so. Uh, through economic growth, the countries, a defense budget can be increased. 
for defense capabilities can be enhanced. So I think um, economic uh, growth can contribute to uh, the security at the same time. So I think, um, yes. Okay, I can continue. Um, the second point and the third point, the second type of the threat and the third type of the threat, uh, they are uh, actually linked, uh, like a uh, uh, theft of um, important technology, so economic uh, statecraft being a strategy of an adversary country. Uh, we need to have rules to prevent uh, those types of threats, and those rules can be quite effective. And what's important is rule-based investment and trade or economic activities. We have to come up with cert certain systems in place, more specifically RCEP, CPTPP, these can be such rules, they are very important, and WTO is also important, but in any case, we have to rebuild the rules of WTO. And uh, I am really paying my attention to RCEP, because uh, China, uh, being a problematic country uh, in terms of an economy, an unfair trade practice is being practiced by China to a quite great extent. In order to amend such activities on the part of China, we have to make sure that China abides by the rules of RCEP. And China uh, would like to come to CPTPP, and uh, a review of their application needs to be done thoroughly so that China, uh, once that pass a such review, only once China Pass, passes uh, the strict re review, they can come to CPTPP. So rules are very important. And the third point, I don't have to repeat this again, but recent discussions in relation to China is what if, if uh, China invades Taiwan? And we have uh, quite active discussions in Japan on that point, but we have to avoid that from happening. And for that, we need to have diplomacy. Diplomacy needs to be discussed more. That's all from me. Thank you very much, Urata-san. Um, so look, all our panelists have talked about claiming back multilateral cooperation and trying to find positive sum engagement in this increasingly difficult environment. And I think a starting point is to recognize that what we can manage in Asia and the cooperation we have here is built on the existing global order. Uh, and the existing global order that's been open has multilateral rules uh, and the rule of law. And that, of course, needs reform. Uh, it's a major asset that we have that needs to be protected, and Asia will play an increasingly important role in protecting that. Uh, and it's important to recognize there's no alternative. So in doubling down on, on the existing multilateral order in, in our region, um, thinking about just a little bit more deeply about this for ASEAN, I think, and ASEAN's partners, as, as our, our panelists mentioned. Um, you know, the core principles of ASEAN um, that our panelists have spoke, uh, spoken about, it keeps options open for countries in Southeast Asia. It acts as a buffer and it allows policy, policy space and I think Southeast Asia still continues to see economic interdependence, including with China and the other major powers around it, as a source of security, not just prosperity. So there's a positive sum, uh, positive economic spillovers to security. But I think that positive sum relationships under threat increasingly as major powers around ASEAN start to see economic interdependence as a security vulnerability. Um, interdependence has been weaponized. And it's under threat, of course, from growing security tensions and the, the realist thinking that's starting to dominate, as Pak Rizal mentioned. Uh, so we've got a, a few questions in on Slido, and thank you, we'll get to those. But uh, before we do, I want to ask each of our panelists a question, uh, just to kick off the discussion. Uh, and if we could keep the responses um, as uh, succinct as possible, uh, that'll be great. But I want to start with Danny. Uh, you talked about the false dichotomy um, or cross response to COVID, but also now in economics and national security. Now, of course, that false di dichotomy for COVID ended when we found a vaccine. Um, what's the vaccine factor for 
uh, that can change the false dichotomy with the economics and security uh, trade-off that you mentioned. Um, so we can move back to positive sum economic competition and engagement. And just to add to that, I think, um, I mean, I agree with your economic analysis and economic competition being positive sum uh, and security competition being zero sum or in fact even negative sum. Um, you know, a lot of IR realists or security specialists might call that naive given what's happened over the last 10 years, a uh, decade or so. Uh, I wonder what your response is to that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Shiro, for, for the, those excellent questions. And indeed for uh, <coughs> simmering so beautifully the conversations that we've had so far. If I may, I might have uh, uh, two reactions to your questions. The first is very pointedly, uh, you said that my um, story about how the world navigated our experience with COVID uh, was very clearly resolved when we discovered vaccines and we applied that. Now, so let me uh, also point out that actually um, getting that acceptance of vac vaccines was itself a struggle. Part of the reason that China has taken so long uh, to come back into the idea that we want to be on a, a different point in that trade-off was its own refusal uh, for nationalist reasons or otherwise to, to not accept what the world had already done and achieved. That was a, a, a huge obstacle. So the vaccine story then is instructive in how it got the world to unify on this. Right? The world needed to be brought around to understand the same issues because otherwise, we would still, even with the presence of vaccines, we might still have a China that continues to be in lockdown. So acceptance, understanding, communication are hugely important, as much as just the physical ex existence of the vaccine. The world coming together to counter an external threat is a wonderful uh, uh, force that makes us come to this mutual understanding. So rather lightheartedly, sometimes I think the vaccine that we need is a Martian invasion of our planet or the zombie apocalypse. But failing either of those, we've got plenty of other issues that can serve as vaccines. The world's um, uh, progress on the global climate crisis is something that needs to be accelerated by all nations coming together. If we focus on those win-win situations, we can get around the idea that we don't yet have a vaccine. Actually, we do. We've not just uh, come to an agreement on that. As for the realist criticism of um, this stance that I described, I, I might just say that um, I too am an economist, and if realists have a dismal view of human nature, it is like nothing compared to the view of human nature that economists have. Economists have the worst view of human nature there is. However, economists have been able to resolve that by saying that if you have the right rules in place, or if not the right rules, recognizing that anarchy is not a stable resting point, that institutions develop endogenously to overcome the chaos that is anarchy. We simply have to let these institutions emerge because it will have to be ultimately self-interest, not like-mindedness, not shared values, but self-interest that brings the world together to solve these grand challenges. And I think economists reconcile our view of the dismal human nature, that everyone is miserable, they're just out for themselves, together with the view that actually you should harness that, not lament that that leads to war, but harness the energy of that self-interest to come up with solutions like the Industrial Revolution, globalization, the international financial structure, all of these things came about because of self-interest, not because there was a law that said we had to have them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. And of course, um
economics got its name as a dismal science in opposition to slavery, of course, from, from Thomas Carlyle. So it's not all, not all bad news, but the power of self-interest, I think, and, and fighting a common enemy. Um, we may have aliens, actually. They're being shot down over the North America right now. But, but more pointedly, uh, you identify climate change um, as a common enemy. And I think this is where perhaps, Melly, you can um, help us think through from what you talked about. Um, how do we avoid this prisoner's dilemma? How do we get to multilateral um, cooperation when the immediate national interest, you know, from our various polities um, and the political economy in our countries, uh, would suggest that cooperation uh, isn't the biggest payoff in the um, immediate future, especially when the United States and other countries uh, are not in the mood to cooperate in this way? Because uh, I thought, of course, like many of us, Climate change would be what brought the United States and China together to, to fight this common enemy, but that has, has not panned out. So uh, what can we do in this part of the world uh, to avoid that prisoner's dilemma uh, and get back to multilateral cooperation? I think when um, countries in Asia decided to promote multilateralism, it is precisely because it is the only way they think that you can actually try to mitigate major power competition. It, it is naive to think that you can actually get everyone on the same boat, so to speak. But let me go back to this so-called dichotomy that Danny was talking about. It is naive to think that there will never, there will be an end to major competition, power competition. It will always be there. But the world is not black and white. You can live <laughs> with cooperation. So, so the point is cooperation and competition can coexist. And this is what has happened in our part of the world. I mean, whether you like it or not, you know, you have, in this region, East Asia, you have China and Japan <laughs> and South Korea, right? Despite the long historical animosity, they have shown that in the plus three framework, they can actually cooperate. Why? Because when you talk about the kind of threats that you face, sure, territorial disputes will always be there. But it takes forever to settle territorial disputes. Just look at the South China Sea. We've been talking about this, about this issue for decades, but it doesn't stop countries from Southeast Asia to cooperate with China, despite the suspicion that China could continue to push and push for territorial gains, right? And that's just the reality. Because without this kind of institutions that Rizal was talking about, the world will continue to be brutish and nasty. You know, you're talking about philosophy going back, right? I mean, Thomas Hobbes says, without a state, life is brutish and nasty. But without institutions, life can even be more brutish and even be more nasty. And especially, let me go back to the main point, that the kind of challenges we face today, right, this is what they call 21st, is, is something that is not, it's man-made, but the what we see, I mean, a virus is, doesn't carry passports. You don't see it, right? The environment, the environment is not, a, is not a threat. In fact, the environment itself has been threatened by human activity. And yet, when you don't take, it, take care of the environment, you don't want to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, right? Then you're really looking at a probably, if you talk about the worst case scenario that the scientists have said, if you go beyond 1.5, just a two or 3% increase in temperature, right? You're talking about a world that is increasingly inhabitable. I mean, when you talk about, you know, what is state security is when you have your own territory, right? But if you lose your territory as a result of climate change, like what you see in, in the Maldives and even in the Pacific, what's gonna happen to your people? And is there even, you know, do, do they even have a state to talk about, a territory to talk about? And what do you do with massive human displacement? The scenarios are very, are very scary, if you like. So while you can have technological war, <laughs> while can you have real you know, weaponization of economic interdependence, there's that other threat out there, that shared threat to humanity, and there's no choice, right? So, and if you break down that competition, Shiro, I mean, you know, they, do, they don't cooperate in, in, you know, in trying to agree to COPS discussion, et cetera, but there's cooperation in many things. Right, so I think we have to broaden our analysis because the world is not black and white, right? So a more broader, perhaps, or if you peel down, peel it, it down to layers, and this is where in our region, 
the kind of cooperation that's taking place in health. You talk about vaccines, right? I mean, think about a region that doesn't even have access to vaccines, while other countries, uh, unethical to think about, have more vaccines. Other parts in Africa and all that don't even have access to the first or second dose. Yeah, and yet if you don't take care of what's happening in Africa, you can have diseases traveling because of globalization, <laughs> right? Because of travel. So we are now faced in a world where you have no choice but cooperate, while at the same time be mindful that there is that big game out there. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Melly. Yeah, and look, you mentioned Japan and China, and of course we've got South Korea in there as well, Northeast Asia. Um, has managed to get together and cooperate around ASEAN frameworks, remarkably, the ASEAN plus three process, but also are now in a free trade agreement through RCEP uh, and the importance of, of ASEAN there. So I'll turn to Puck Rizal now um, and just ask you to elaborate a bit on your um, final point there of how ASEAN-centred institutions can help um, make this change. Now, you mentioned um, abolishing the ARF and moving to the East Asia Summit. But I have a question here on Slido from, from Peter Drysdale. Um, of course, EAS includes Russia and the United States. So what arrangement might be best, given that difficulty, uh, and what exactly needs to be done there? And just to complicate things even further, how effective are ASEAN institutions going to be going forward, given the problem of Myanmar? That's a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> well, l let me begin by you know, uh, trying to answer the first part of the, the questions. So I think it's, of course, a very important question about you know, strategies and uh, 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 what sort of instruments that we can use in order to bring back the whole notion of comprehensive security. So in this context, so I think one of the most possible uh, 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 approach or strategy that might be appealing to the policymakers it's actually, you know, to turn into the existing institutions. Because, you know, in, in, in my head, there are two options. One, you know, you just create new institution and then try to set up that institution to address a specific and emerging problem that we are facing. But that's, you know, I think it's almost impossible, if not, you know, uh, 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 I mean, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible. The second option is actually look around and then try to look at what we have. So here, I think, it might be appealing if we can come up with the ideas that we need to give a platform or a roadmap for an institution that we already have, which is the East Asia Summit. This is, I attended the East Asia Summit before. It was a very boring, you know, meeting. Like, you know, you see like 10 people, you know, leaders of ASEAN, and, no, no, 10 ASEAN, you know, and then, you know, the other, you know, dialogue partners. And then each of them, you know, speak three minutes to five minutes, you know, and the ASEAN chair would answer, well, Japan is very important, we recognize your role, you know, so let's move forward and so on. And then the US speak, you know, also, the ASEAN will respond exactly the same, change the word Japan into the United States. Okay. So it's not much is going on in that context. So I think, you know, we need you know, to really try to institutionalize the East Asia Summit and then try to bring, you know, new areas of cooperation or let's say new roadmap, you know, for this Asia Summit. Yes, Russia is there, yeah, China is there, but precisely of the presence of these powers. So I think you know, uh, this is you know, more appropriate you know, because ASEAN believe in the importance of the inclusivity you know, as the uh, principles of regional uh, uh, cooperations. But of course, you know, it's not going to be effective. We know that you know, ASEAN is only one of the uh, 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 modalities out there. But, you know, nonetheless, it's there. You know, other has not provided any alternative beyond military alliance, you know, beyond a military build-up, you know, and, and so on. So only ASEAN that continue to work pro in providing a platform that can try to create norms and also s institutions in addition to the realist order, which is based on, you know, power politics out there in our region. So I think you know we need to rely on that. That's the, the first one. The second one, I think it's very important, you know, to uh, f because uh, Uratasan mentioned about RCEP. So I think here the strategy that we need to do actually ASEAN need to reclaim the RCEP. So because you know the perception out there, the RCEP as if it's actually initiative by other powers, right? It is not. It is actually 
an inherently ASEAN initiative, which I think, you know, uh, get a lot of support by other extra regional powers, especially the dialogue partners. So we need to reclaim that, you know, and then, of course, this brings me back to the third important point. What about Myanmar? RCEP cannot move forward, you know, before Myanmar ratify, but we don't want the junta to ratify it. So how? So I think this is the best time for ASEAN to show to the world that, you know, we don't need 10 in order to move forward on certain important initiatives such as the RCEP. So we need to just leave Myanmar behind and then move forward. So the ASEAN minus X principle will be put into practice. So this is, I think, very important, you know, uh, development for ASEAN if ASEAN can agree on that. So it is now responsibility of Indonesia as the chair to make sure that ASEAN should move forward with the nine and other ASEAN countries to make RCEP you know, as a successful without waiting for the ratification from uh, the government of Myanmar because we don't know yet you know, how this uh, problem in, in Myanmar will uh, 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 come about. I mean, the, the, the resolution of it. Uh, well, this is, I think it's important because Myanmar has been used or seen as the only issue that will define any chairmanship of any ASEAN member. Even though, of course, you know, Indonesia already keeps saying that, you know, we don't want to be a single issue chairman, you know, of ASEAN. So we also want to put attention on other uh, issues, including on RCEP, on the code of conduct of South China Sea, and also on how that we can strengthen the ASEAN capacity and uh, uh, effectiveness that uh, the Minister of Finance mentioned uh, uh, earlier. Uh, look at like this, the five principles of five point consensus, you know, I think only three matters the most. Stop violence, deliver humanitarian assistance, and then all inclusive dialogue. The first one has been tried by other chairs of ASEAN, failed. The second one is also tried by other chair of ASEAN, failed. Indonesia will try to do the third one, how we can facilitate and create an environment that will be conducive for all the parties you know, to go into all-inclusive dialogue. Mm -hmm. The problem with this approach, it has to be done quietly. So, you know, because it's so quiet, so we don't know much about it. <laughs> and then can only be judged at the end of Indonesia's you know, chairmanship. I hope as an Indonesian, Indonesian, we're not going to fail. So I hope that you know, the junta will come to their sense that will realize that they need to talk you know, with other parties and also for the other parties to come to the same realis realization. Only through the all-inclusive dialogue, I think they can really try to find political settlement to the current problem. So otherwise, what we can do as Indonesia, as a chair, just pray that December will come faster than before. Then we can give it to Laos. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I think, uh, I don't think it was praying that got the surprise in the G20 summit and having the communique. It was the quiet diplomacy behind the scenes. So we're hoping for another quiet year with a big positive announcement at, at the end. Uh, you talked about East Asia Summit as the potential way forward. Uh, of course, East Asia Summit doesn't have that economic underpinning in it. It's very weak. That happens in other forums. So it's still got that sort of zero-sum uh, mentality to it in a way. It, it, it lacks the positive sum, which makes it a mixed interest game, I think, and that's what um, others were talking about. A and you're right, we don't want new institutions, so how can we, and I think you got to this um, by talking about RCEP and other institutions, how can we connect the different arrangements and forums uh, to better connect the economic and other agendas um, to turn these what look like less effective um, confrontational uh, arrangements and the, the stand-up speeches that don't go anywhere into more open multilateral forums with economic cooperation or engagement, the positive sum underpinning it. So I think, you know, RCEP does have an economic cooperation agenda in the middle of it, and Indonesia and ASEAN needs to lead on in elevating that and making the most of that because that that's not just a technical cooperation um, capacity building agenda that that really has min a ministerial process in fact a leaders process and institutional architecture that can be and should be utilized for some of the bigger challenges we, we're facing um, so on that 
note, I want to ask Urata-san about some of these uh, economic arrangements in our region. Um, first, to recognise, and um, I think this has come up earlier, but the United States and stepping away from its leadership role, especially in the WTO, um, but has put forward IPEF, um, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Um, there's a question here from Jenny Cord Gordon in Australia. Um, how do you see the US pursuit of IPEF working with other regional processes, APEC, ASEAN, and CPTPP, and RCEP, uh, in improving cooperation and trade and investment in the digital economy? Now, is IPEF going to be enough without the United States re-engaging in CPTPP, for example? Um, and then, I think, a follow-on question from Peter Drysdale, again, on... RCEP and, oh sorry, on China and CPTPP. Would negotiation with China over entry help strengthen comprehensive security in Asia and increase confidence in the global system or would it be divisive? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Shiro san uh, Let me respond to the last uh, question which was, I guess, raised by Peter uh, Drysdale. Uh, I think, uh, well, as I mentioned or, or, or talked about the uh, relationship between China and CPTPP in my earlier uh, intervention. Uh, China has applied to join CPTPP, uh, and uh, I think uh, our members, Australia, Japan, and other countries, uh, should use this opportunity to make sure that China uh, has, uh, by, the, by the rules in WTO and other forum, uh, RCEP is a very good uh, litmus test for this because, uh, you know, RCPP uh, entered into force uh, last year and uh, it's been only a one year but uh, maybe we can use this one year to see whether China has implemented what uh, China has agreed to implement. Uh, and so CPTPP can be used as another opportunity to make sure that China will abide by the rules international rules. So uh, if that happens, and then uh, uh, that would lead to, I think, greater, uh, 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 what's, what's, what's the expression? That will contribute to, I think, comprehensive security in this region, economic security for sure. Uh, and that's how I look at the uh, uh, in importance of international rules-based uh, system like CPTPP, like RCEP. Um, and uh, as uh, Shiro san mentioned, it is very important to make sure that uh, there'll be a maybe benefit for the members to be a, a part of the uh, framework. And uh, through this uh, communication uh, and also uh, uh, through the actual behavior of these countries in this uh, framework, we can make sure that the every all the countries in the region, all the countries in the framework, uh, can gain benefits. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I'll, I'll open it up to any panelist who wants to come in on any of those issues that have been raised. But as I do that, I, I will ask another question from um, Slido. This is from Josh, uh, and I'll I'll get Melly and Puck Rizal to, to answer this, but. What are your views on the increasing number of security and strategy related minilateral agreements um, that predispose conflict over cooperation? We can think of a few, AUKUS, Quad and others. And if cooperation can overcome a false dichotomy where the prevailing narratives does not favor dynamic view of the global economy. Please. Let me uh, take a first stab at this. Um, <coughs> Sure, the creation of minilateralism appears to be um, a threat, or perceived really as a threat to multilateral institutions. But if you look at what AUKUS is, uh, sorry, what um, AUKUS, I, I will not, um, it's, it's to me it's a slightly different character to, to um, Quad, right? But if you look at how Quad has evolved, um, in the first two years, you can see, especially last year, you can see that it's actually changed. Right, Quad has always been seen as a way to contain China, and as you know, other countries, the, the members of the Quad has not made 
has, has not denied that. But because Quad was perceived to be competing with or taking away the energy <laughs> from other countries, if you look at its agenda, right, suddenly the Quad agenda is not just about maritime security. It's gone into health security, and it's gone into climate change. And what does it tell you? One is, of course, the countries do not want to be seen as advancing an agenda that is, um, that is concerning to other countries in the region, right? But at the same time, it wants to present the image that whatever work it does in providing for security complements with that of existing frameworks. And in this case, you have the East Asia Summit and you have the ARF for security and you have the ASEAN Defense Ministerial Meeting. The ADMM Plus is very important if you look at the character, right? It was the first, when it was established in 2005, you know, there was a lot of concern that, you know, if, if Asia says we're not going to have a NATO, is this going to be a NATO for Asia? But again, if you look at the agenda of ADMM, right, apart from maritime security, counterterrorism, there's also delivering medicine to bad places, which is military medicine, right? So it tells you that you can get distracted by a slew of n what we call non-traditional security, and I want to pitch it because it's really what I'm doing. But you can't get away from it. So you have to tailor, even if it is superficial on the, uh, on the, you know, at, at the first glance, that you have, they have to be seen to be also engaged with the issues. And we really, in the context of ASEAN, it's, it's a wonderful development because now you can actually sort of align some of your agenda with the existing agenda. And East Asia Summit, as Rizal has mentioned, it's really very important because when the East Asia Summit um, in 20, tw uh, 2011, was, the agenda was being defined, there was a lot of concern. This is East Asia Summit. This is the first time you can bring all these leaders to talk about security challenges, right? So let's bring in the context of nuclear nonproliferation, which is an important issue, right? And in fact, the chair then, Indonesia, uh, and, and uh, the former foreign minister, Martina Talgawa, said, we have to talk about, you know, nuclear nonproliferation or whether, because it's, we have the East Asia Summit. And yet other countries in ASEAN were saying, wait a minute, why don't we also include health security? Why don't we also include economic security? So I don't think it's just a question of widening the agenda, but many countries, particularly the smaller ones, really think the more frameworks you have there, right? This is what the Singaporean uh, official Bilahari would say, let's have all these variable geometries, whatever is available, let's have that, not to compete, <laughs> to have as many choices as possible. Just very briefly on the AUKUS is a bit different. You know, I think AUKUS is, in my view at least, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's only an arrangement, you know, for technology, uh, defense technology cooperation. So, you know, it's a bit difficult to look at that, you know, within the larger multilateral, you know, uh, 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 a cooperative framework that ASEAN uh, or other countries has in, in the region. But the Quad is, is, is more interesting. I think, you know, if we uh, think about, you know, how we can basically order and reorder the regional uh, security issue uh, because of precisely because of the areas that they've gone uh, into. Uh, the, the only concern I think that ASEAN and many ASEAN countries uh, uh, have with regard to this minilateral quote unquote uh, arrangement is that it will or it might undermine the so-called ASEAN centrality. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the only concern that people actually are working together outside the ASEAN led or ASEAN centered multilateral processes. So there is that, that concern. But I think instead of being concerned and then suddenly become you know, hostile or, or antipathy toward those kind of arrangements, it's better also you know, for ASEAN, like uh, uh, Professor Meli just mentioned, to look at which areas that where you know, the works actually overlap with, with the work of ASEAN or ASEAN-centered uh, multilateral uh, process, processes. Jokingly, I would always say that you know, probably ASEAN should see Quad as a working group of this Asia Summit. So they all are, you know, partners of ASEAN anyway, you know. So, so that sort of, you know, uh, framework that I'm thinking that East Asia Summit can have, you know, a number of uh, area priorities for, 
cooperation, which include, I think, uh, should include the economic cooperation as well. Or it can act as the coordinating council that organize the EPEC. So do not forget EPEC. Uh, EPEC is very important. So I think people tend not to discuss it these days. Uh, and also the RCEP and also other institutions. So all issues can be discussed. This is leaders led, you know, leaders level uh, a summit of the East Asia summit. So if they can act as the, some kind of like Indo-Pacific coordinating council, then you know, I think that's you know, one idea that we can also try to explore on how these leaders can bring together economic and security and other uh, cooperation in, in the, many will disagree <laughs> you know, you know, uh, uh, with that. Uh, second point, Quad and AUKUS are not on the only multilateral cooperations in the region. They have been there, Mekong cooperation, and then Indonesia, Thailand, uh, what is the uh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, yeah. I think arrangement yeah. and so on. Yeah. It's all there. It's quite functional uh, co uh, uh, cooperation, of course. Uh, 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 so I, I can't really understand why suddenly ASEAN can do it or China can do it, but not others. So that's you know, I think there is a need you know for uh, everyone to really discuss that and then convey you know why they see the need to do that. But if you ask me as a realist international relations scholar, AUKUS and Quad happen because nothing in ASEAN can prevent it from happening. Thank you, Pak Rizal. We're fast running out of time, so I'll, I'll give every panelist a, a chance to pick up on any issue they wanted uh, with a, a question thrown out there, and you can answer this if you wish or address another point. Um, but this question, does moving away from a dualistic approach mean redividing high politics and low politics, or should new concepts and frameworks be developed in light of recent developments? So that throws down the gauntlet, um, but um, maybe Danny, starting with you, and then if you'd like to address that or any other point, uh, and we'll come down the um, uh, Thank you, Shiro. Uh, the, I, I wanted to, if I may then, take that point and maybe set down what I think a bottom line, at least from where I sit, is. Um, to get where we want to go, it is not collaboration, explicit collaboration in the form of named initial regional groupings that we need. It is simply the view that we build an institutional understanding that takes us away from zero-sum competition. We don't have to explicitly collaborate. We just don't have to get in each other's way. And out of that, through either the dynamics of the economic marketplace, or otherwise, we can go a long way. My second concluding thought based on a lot of this discussion is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Don't wait until we come up with the actual final ultimate grouping that does touches all the right buttons before we start working together. Let's have lots and lots of uh, different kinds of groupings and organizations and different interests and regions because we're all working towards the same end. The fact that we don't achieve that end doesn't mean that we shouldn't agree to going halfway towards that end. So don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> I always start my lecture <laughs> in class quoting the statement by the UN Secretary General. He's been saying this for the last four or five years. He talks about we're living in a dangerous world. And he uses the word dangerous, and then when you look at the rest of the statement, he talks about a slew of security challenges that really makes, that endangers state and human security. So what it points out is we're really, not, it's not just a dangerous world, it is da dangerous because the world that we know today is so much different from the world that we know before, right? I mean, <coughs> even down to scholarship and, and concepts that we talk about, they're, they're increasingly becoming um, obsolete in light of uh, increasingly complex, interconnected world. And so this division about high politics and low politics is already passe, if you like. Maybe 20 years ago, you never talked about health security as becoming a major national security threat for countries. When I was working on health security about 20 years ago, they say, it's not a security issue. 
It's a developmental issue. But lo and behold, we had SARS and we have COVID-19. And you talk about health being a issue of geopolitical importance, right? So the, the division of high politics, talking about territorial disputes and low politics, talking about development, is no longer there. So I think that mindset really has to change. And the mindset about, I like what you say, it's not perfect, but what is the other one? But it can anyway work. Good. So you have institutions in the region that are not perfect, like ASEAN, but they're good in the sense that they help us to refocus on areas of cooperation. But something is missing, and that is that you cannot rely on institutions alone to address your problem. There's an issue about going inside and really looking at state capacity, looking at certain norms that govern the state. The values that we talk about. So national governance, state governance is important before you talk about regional or international governance. Bring back the state, focus on what it has done and what it hasn't done, right? Because if you, you miss looking at the economic security of your people. I mean, look at China and the story of COVID-19. All the health officials, even the Chinese health officials, we say it's untenable you know, if you can have long lockdowns. And at the risk of getting your people demonstrate, right? because the rest of the Chinese were saying the rest of the world is already moving. W you know, how long are you going to keep us locked down? At the risk of having civil disobedience in a state that is highly authoritarian, the government decided to say, okay, open up, but it doesn't have an end game. So the, 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 the death rate of China, unreported, could be in millions. Right? So state capacity is very important. And this thing about high politics and low politics, I think, is something that we really have to th rethink. Thank you. Uh, so very short. The new comprehensive, the, the new notion of co uh, comprehensive security that you know we need to think about and we need to also advocate should really emphasize, I think, state's responsibility to ensure human security. Mm -hmm. You know, and from all form of threat, especially the threats that Uratasan you know mentioned, which can actually ruin not only the security of the citizen, but also ruin the security of others and drag other uh, the country, but you know, drag also other countries, you know, into that uh, uh, insecurity. So that's I think you know should be at the center of any uh, discourse about uh, the new relevance of the comprehensive security for the region. Yes, just one point. I'd like to emphasize the importance of active communication at all levels. Uh, communication is very, uh, you know, helpful to promote co cooperation, collaboration, for sure. And uh, communication can, I think, can avoid conflict uh, if the communication between you and uh, the adversary country is uh, well established. So communication is very important, particularly, uh, you know, uh, maybe like conference like this, uh, I mean, it's very important to let uh, us know what uh, we are thinking about uh, to the audience and to the other you know, groups of people. So I guess communication, I just like emphasize the importance of communication. Thank you. Thank you, Rata-san. So um, that discussion has been extremely helpful in, in my thinking. Um, I think you know, my initial question to Danny about being naive was a bit of a, a setup because it does help us think about you know, those who created the Bretton Woods institutions, they were not naive. Uh, they saw the lack of economic sovereignty and the horrors of economic weapons, economic aggression leading to conflict and war. So the order that grew, the global order that grew out of Bretton Woods, you know, embedded in them, the, in it, the principles of equal treatment, multilateral cooperation, economic sovereignty. And that really contributed to our security, economic security but national security. And we don't need a, a world war to protect and create a new uh, or reform the existing order. So in this context now, war in, in Russia, uh, war in, in Europe, um, strategic competition, still the rest of the world and this part of the world that is dynamic, economically dynamic, is large and we have a, a huge strategic interest in the rules-based order, openness and multilateral cooperation. So I take everyone's points, claim back cooperation, um, and common security, 
break out of this false dichotomy, as Danny said, and as, as Pak Rizal said, move from the one dimension to the three dimensions, um, uh, we can think a bit more creatively here. And we do have a common enemy. We've got existential, existential threats um, that should and will, I hope, bring us together in a productive way, not further divide us. So we, are, we have these assets of ASEAN-centred institutions. They were enough to bring Japan, China, and Korea together. If you can do that, you can do almost anything, I think. Um, we, we've got East Asia Summit, APEC, RCEP, and of course, the, no one's mentioned this, but things like the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Um, and it's really a time of elevated importance and leadership from ASEAN, I think, to use this variable geometry, however you want to describe it, um, strategically, but also pragmatically. Don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. I think that's where we want to uh, search for these, this new framework of comprehensive regional security so that we don't start to, to hunker down and hide in a corner, but we can have um, cooperation, positive sum, engagement globally, uh, and make it through this worrying time and change our trajectory. So with that, I, I want to thank Rieti once again and very much thank uh, the panel, our experts from across Southeast Asia, uh, really to help us think of new ways forward. Uh, and that's important for Japan, for Australia, but also, of course, uh, ASEAN and the region more broadly. So thank you very much. Thank you.